STS-131 ISS Assembly Flight 19A was a NASA Space Shuttle mission to the International Space Station ISS. Space Shuttle Discovery launched on 5 April 2010 at 6.21 a.m. from Kennedy Space Center's launch pad 39A, and landed at 9.08 a.m. on 20 April 2010 on runway 33 at the Kennedy Space Center's shuttle landing facility. The mission marked the longest flight for Space Shuttle Discovery. The primary payload was a multipurpose logistics module loaded with supplies and equipment for the International Space Station. The mission also removed and replaced an ammonia tank assembly outside the station on the S-1 truss. STS-131 furthermore carried several onboard payloads, this mission had the most payloads since STS-107. It is also the last shuttle mission with a crew of seven. Kuru <laughs> Topic. Mission payload Topic. Multipurpose Logistics Module Leonardo The primary payload of STS-131 was the Multipurpose Logistics Module MPLM Leonardo. The MPLM was filled with food and science supplies for the International Space Station ISS. The MPLM also carried the third and final minus 80 degree laboratory freezer for ISS Melfi, Window Orbital Research Facility Wharf, one crew quarters rack, the muscle atrophy resistive exercise mares rack, resupply stowage racks RSRs, as well as resupply stowage platforms RSPs. Topic: Lightweight multipurpose equipment support structure carrier. The lightweight multipurpose equipment support structure carrier (LMC) carried a refurbished ammonia tank assembly (ADA) to the ISS. The refurbished ADA was removed from the space station and returned for use on this mission during STS-128. It was swapped with an empty tank which will ride home on the LMC. Tridar This mission was the second flight of the TRIDAR, a 3D dual-sensing laser camera, intended for potential use as an autonomous rendezvous and docking sensor. TRIDAR provides guidance information that can be used to guide a vehicle during rendezvous and docking operations in space. TRIDAR does not rely on any reference markers, such as reflectors, positioned on the target spacecraft. To achieve this, it relies on a laser-based 3D sensor and a thermal imager. Geometric information contained in successive 3D images is matched against the known shape of the target object to calculate its position and orientation in real time. The TRIDAR tracked the ISS position and orientation from the shuttle during docking, undocking, and flyaround operations. <laughs> <laughs> Mission milestones The mission marked, 162nd NASA manned space flight 131st shuttle mission since STS-1 
38th Flight of Discovery 33rd Shuttle Mission to the ISS 106th Post Challenger Mission 18th Post Columbia Mission 35th and last night launch of a shuttle, 22nd night launch from launch pad 39A 2nd. Descending node. Entry since 2003. <laughs> shuttle processing Space Shuttle Discovery was moved from its hangar in the Orbiter Processing Facility OPF3 to the nearby Vehicle Assembly Building on the 22nd of February 2010. The rollover was completed around 10:30 Eastern Standard Time. According to NASA, the rollover occurred a day earlier than announced to take advantage of favorable weather in advance of poor conditions forecasted on the next day, an earlier plan to move Discovery into the VAB on 12 February 2010 was delayed because of cold weather at the Kennedy Space Center. For the rollover, temperatures in the Vehicle Assembly Building VAB, had to be above 45 degrees Fahrenheit 7 degrees Celsius for more than 12 hours because Discovery was not attached to any heating purges to protect its systems from potential damage from the cold. Space Shuttle Discovery began its trip, known as the Rollout, to launch pad 39A at 23.58 Eastern Standard Time time on the 2nd of March 2010 the complete shuttle stack and mobile launch platform were secured to the launch pad 39A structure at 6:49 eastern standard time on the 3rd of March 2010 the 3.4 miles 5.5 kilometers trek took 6 hours 51 minutes to complete the rollout was delayed 24 hours by the threat of lightning from a passing cold front. That weather moved away, and the stiff wind gusts blowing on Florida's space coast on the next day were not a factor for the rollout. Ahead of the rollout, engineers noticed some damage caused by birds to the external tank ET-135, which was repaired inside the VAB. Birds had managed to reach the tank, and pecked away at the Thermal Protection System TPS foam. Topic. Mission timeline. Topic: The 5th of April, Flight Day One launch. Space Shuttle Discovery lifted off successfully at 6:21 Eastern Daylight Saving Time. After the eight and a half minute ride to space, Discovery's seven person crew began configuring the orbiter from a launch vehicle to an orbital vehicle. Commander Alan Poindexter and pilot Jim Dutton, with help from mission specialist 2 Dorothy Metcalf Lindenberger, also performed a series of engine firings or burns to adjust their speed and refine their path to the International Space Station. While the engine burns were going on, the rest of the crew opened the payload bay doors, set up the computers and KU band antenna. The antenna suffered a failure during normal checkout and setup on orbit. Due to the failure, the normal downlink of imagery of the external tank was not completed. The crew on board will monitor the inspections of the Thermal Protection System TPS in real time and will note any spots of interest and let the ground know while downlinking the imagery after docking. The dish antenna also serves as a radar antenna, measuring the distance to the space station. Topic. 
Topic: The 6th of April, flight day 2 inspections. The seven-person crew of STS-131 was awakened to begin their first full day in space on flight day two. Due to the lack of KU band communication, changes to the crew's daily plan were read up for them to write out. After their post-sleep activities, Commander Alan Poindexter and Pilot Jim Dutton fired Discovery's Orbital Maneuvering System OMS engines to correct and further refine the shuttle's path to the ISS. Astronauts Naoko Yamazaki and Dorothy Metcalf Lindenberger began activating and checking out the Shuttle Remote Manipulator System SRMS, also known as the Canadarm. While Metcalf Lindenberger and Yamazaki were working with Canadarm, Stephanie Wilson was getting equipment together and set up to record the inspections of the Shuttle's heat shield. The inspections were recorded so they could be downlinked to the ground once docked to the ISS. Once all that work was done, Commander Poindexter and Pilot Dutton joined Metcalf Lindenberger, Yamazaki, and Wilson to conduct the inspection of the shuttle's heat shield. While the inspection was going on, Rick Mastracchio and Clayton Anderson were on the mid-deck of Discovery checking out the extravehicular mobility units and getting them ready for their three spacewalks. The last portion of the crew day was spent preparing and checking out all of the tools used during rendezvous. Topic: The 7th of April, flight day 3 docking. Space Shuttle Discovery successfully docked with the space station at 7:44 coordinated universal time, 3:44 Eastern Daylight Saving Time on the 7th of April 2010 as the two spacecraft sailed 220 miles above the Caribbean. The crew performed six successful engine firings to set up the on-time docking. Prior to docking Commander Poindexter guided Discovery through the standard rendezvous pitch maneuver RPM. Station Commander Oleg Kotov and Flight Engineer T.J. Kremer took more than 350 photos of Discovery's heat shield. Once Discovery docked to the International Space Station ISS, a series of leak checks were done on both sides of the hatch by the shuttle and station crews. The hatches between the two vehicles were opened at 9:11 coordinated universal time, 5:11 Eastern Daylight Saving Time, which was 30 minutes earlier than planned. Once the hatches were opened the STS-131 crew got a safety briefing from the station crew, then began to transfer items that would be needed for later in the day and early on flight day 4. Two items that were transferred were the two emus that will be used for the three spacewalks. The crew also completed a grapple of the Orbiter Boom Sensor System OBSS with the Space Station Remote Manipulator System SSRMS also known as Canadarm2. Once the OBSS was grappled it was unberthed from the starboard sill of the Space Shuttle payload bay, and handed off to the SRMS. Throughout the day, after docking to the station, the shuttle crew began downlinking all of the inspection video from flight day 2, and launch imagery and video. The 8th of April, flight day 4 MPLM ingress 
On flight day, four Stephanie Wilson and Naoko Yamazaki grappled and berthed the Multipurpose Logistics Module MPLM Leonardo. The MPLM was berthed to the station at 424 Coordinated Universal Time, 024 Eastern Daylight Saving Time. The hatches were opened by station flight engineer Soichi Noguchi and shuttle mission specialist Clayton Anderson at 1158 Coordinated Universal Time, 758 Eastern Daylight Saving Time. The joint STS-131, Expedition 23 crews began transferring cargo from the MPLM, with the first item being a Rate Euro Assembly RGA, which will be replaced on the first spacewalk of the mission. During flight day, 4 Commander Alan Poindexter did several in-flight interviews. Commander Poindexter was joined by mission specialists Rick Mastracchio and Stephanie Wilson. The interviews were with the Tom Joyner Radio Show, WVIT-TV and Fox News Radio. At the end of the day Mastracchio and Anderson entered the Quest airlock and begin breathing pure oxygen for an hour, while the atmospheric pressure inside the airlock was lowered to 10.2 psi. This procedure is known as the pre-breathe protocol and is done before every spacewalk, to purge nitrogen from the blood stream and prevent decompression sickness. Topic: The 9th of April, Flight Day 5, Eva 1. Flight Day 5 saw the completion of the first spacewalk by Rick Mastracchio and Clayton Anderson. The pair released the new ammonia tank assembly for transfer to station for installation on a later spacewalk. They also removed an experiment from outside on the Kibo Exposed Facility, replaced a Rate Euro Assembly RGA, and performed several get-ahead tasks. The spacewalking pair was assisted by the SSRMS which was operated by pilot Jim Dutton and mission specialist Stephanie Wilson. While the spacewalk was going on, Naoko Yamazaki was assisted by Commander Alan Poindexter, and the Expedition 23 crew to move several of the large science racks from the MPLM Leonardo to their new location on the ISS. Topic: The 10th of April, Flight Day 6 transfers. Flight Day 6 was dedicated to transferring supplies from the MPLM Leonardo and the Space Shuttle Mid-Deck. The crews transferred the Windows Observational Research Facility Wharf to the Destiny Lab. Mission Specialist Naoko Yamazaki, along with Flight Engineer Soichi Noguchi also transferred the Express Rack 7 ER7 to its final location. During the crew's morning, a smoke alarm sounded in the Russian segment of the station, which prompted the joint crew to move into emergency procedures. However the alarm was false and was cleared within a couple of minutes and all normal work resumed. Mission specialists Clay Anderson, Rick Mastracchio and Stephanie Wilson conducted in-flight interviews with Nebraska Public Radio, CBS Newspath and Radio Network and KETV-TV in Omaha, Nebraska. Later in the day Commander Alan Poindexter, Pilot Jim Dutton and Mission Specialist Dorothy Metcalf Lindenberger talked with students at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. 
At the end of the crew's work day, the joint crew got together and reviewed the procedures for the second spacewalk. After the procedures review spacewalkers Clay Anderson and Rick Mastracchio entered the Quest airlock, closed the hatch and lowered the inside pressure to 10.2 psi. The pair also breathed pure oxygen for an hour while the pressure was being lowered. Topic the 11th of April, Flight Day 7, Eva 2. On Flight Day 7, astronauts Clay Anderson and Rick Mastracchio performed their second spacewalk of the STS-131 mission. Mastracchio and Anderson exited the airlock at 5:30 Coordinated Universal Time, a full 45 minutes ahead of the planned time, and spent 7 hours and 26 minutes outside the ISS. The pair removed the old ammonia tank assembly ADA from the S-1 truss and installed the new ADA. Anderson and Mastracchio ran into a small problem when one of the four bolts that holds the tank in place wouldn't turn. They loosened the other three and tried them all again and the fourth bolt was successfully tightened. The two spacewalkers helped guide the SSRMS to temporarily stow the old Ada on the truss structure. The new Ada had its electrical connections made, but the fluid connections were deferred until the third spacewalk since the EVA was behind the time line. Mastracchio and Anderson also installed two radiator grapple fixture stowage beams on the P-1 truss. While Anderson and Mastracchio were outside, members of the STS-131 crew continued transferring items from Space Shuttle Discovery's mid-deck and the MPLM Leonardo. Overall, the crew had completed about half of the transfer work. Topic. The 12th of April, flight day 8 off duty. The joint STS-131 Expedition 23 crews had the morning off on flight day 8. After their morning off, the crews continued their transfer activities, which are more than 70% complete. The crews also conducted several POW events, including VIP events with Roscosmos, Russian President Dmitry Medvedev, RSC Energia, the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, Japanese students, astronaut Mamoru Mori, and Japanese dignitaries. Later Commander Alan Poindexter, Pilot Jim Dutton and Mission Specialists Dorothy Metcalf Lindenberger and Stephanie Wilson participated in an in-flight interview with several American media outlets including Fox News, ABC World News and MSNBC. While the POW events were going on, Rick Mastracchio and Clay Anderson were preparing the spacesuits and tools they will use for the third and final spacewalk. Later in the day the pair will have a procedures review with other members of the ISS and shuttle crews. After the review, they will enter the airlock, close the hatch and lower the pressure to 10.2 psi and breathe pure oxygen for their camp out. Topic: The 13th of April, flight day 9 EVA 3. On Flight Day 9, Rick Mastracchio and Clay Anderson completed the third and final spacewalk of the STS-131 mission. 
Their tasks included hooking up the ammonia and nitrogen lines to the new ammonia tank assembly ADA, installing the old ADA in the shuttle's payload bay, retrieving some micro-meteoroid orbital debris MMOD shields, bolting a grapple bar which had been removed from the old ADA onto the new ADA, and preparation of some cables on the Z-1 truss and tools to be used during ST. S-132. During the installation of the old Auda in Discovery's payload bay, the spacewalkers had some problems securing a bolt on the Auda to the LMC. The spacewalk took 6 hours and 24 minutes, bringing the total EVA time to 20 hours and 19 minutes. While the EVA was going on, Commander Alan Poindexter and Mission Specialist Naoko Yamazaki continued transferring items from the MPLM to the ISS. Transfer is more than 75% complete. Topic. The 14th of April, flight day, 10 final transfers off duty. The crew of STS-131 continued with transfer activities on the morning of flight day 10. The morning was devoted largely to transferring items to the MPLM Leonardo. There are only a few items awaiting transfer to Space Shuttle Discovery's mid-deck left. The crew enjoyed an hour-long mid-day meal with the Expedition 23 crew. The entire joint crew took part in a crew photo, which was followed by a joint crew news conference with U.S., Russian and Japanese media. Later in the day Commander Alan Poindexter, Mission Specialists Dorothy Metcalf Lindenberger, Stephanie Wilson and Clayton Anderson took time out to talk with students from Eastern Guilford High School in Gibsonville, North Carolina and with third and fourth graders from that school district. The majority of the crew's afternoon was spent off duty. Topic: The 15th of April, flight day 11, MPLM Unberthing. On flight day 11, the MPLM Leonardo's hatches were closed at 7:38 Coordinated Universal Time, 3:38 Eastern Daylight Saving Time, and the MPLM was unberthed from the nadir or Earth-facing port of the Harmony Node at 20:24 Coordinated Universal Time, 16:24 Eastern Daylight Saving Time. It was placed in a low hover, about 3 feet .91 meters above Shuttle Discovery's payload bay. This was done because the MPLM was unberthed from Harmony later than planned. The delay in unberthing was caused by a set of bolts on the common berthing mechanism CBM, getting stuck due to a broken pin. The crew will finish putting Leonardo in the payload bay on flight day 12, prior to the docked late inspection. The crews conducted some transfer operations between the ISS and shuttle mid-deck, which brings the overall transfer operations to 94% complete for the mission. Topic. The 16th of April, flight day 12, late inspection. On flight day 12, the crew of Space Shuttle Discovery secured the MPLM Leonardo in the payload bay for return to Earth. Mission Specialist Dorothy Metcalf Lindenberger activated the latches to secure Leonardo in the payload bay at 7.15 Coordinated Universal Time, 3.15 Eastern Daylight Saving Time. 
After Leonardo was secured, Metcalf Lindenberger, pilot Jim Dutton began the late inspection of Discovery's heat shield. The pair were joined by Commander Alan Poindexter and Mission Specialist Naoko Yamazaki to complete the inspection of the shuttle's reinforced carbon-carbon panels on the wings and nose and the heat-resistant tiles. The scan which takes about seven hours was completed three hours ahead of schedule, and was done while still docked to the International Space Station ISS due to the loss of the shuttle's Ku band antenna. The 17th of April Flight Day 13 undocking Space Shuttle Discovery successfully undocked from the International Space Station ISS at 12:52 coordinated universal time, 8:52 Eastern Daylight Saving Time. Discovery was docked to the ISS for 10 days, 5 hours and 8 minutes. After Discovery departed from the ISS, pilot Jim Dutton took control of the shuttle and performed a fly around of the space station. The undocking was preceded by a farewell ceremony, where shuttle commander Alan Poindexter and station commander Oleg Kotov said farewells on behalf of their crews. After undocking the shuttle crew stowed the Orbiter Boom Sensor System OBSS and the Shuttle Remote Manipulator System SRMS since they will not be needed for the rest of the flight. The crew was also informed that Discovery's heat shield was cleared for re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. Topic. The 18th of April, flight day 14 landing prep. On flight day 14, the crew of Space Shuttle Discovery began their final preparations for landing. The crew packed and stowed away items they no longer need for the rest of the flight. Throughout the day Commander Alan Poindexter and Pilot Jim Dutton completed a series of checkouts of flight systems. These checks include two firings of the Reaction Control System RCS jets and a test of the Flight Control System FCS. Once those checkouts were complete the pair began doing communications checkouts with the Merritt Island Tracking Station and Tracking Stations at the White Sands Space Harbor in New Mexico and Dryden Flight Research Center at Edwards Air Force Base. The crew also took time out of their day to conduct an in-flight interview with WBZAM in Boston, Massachusetts, the Associated Press and Kesey TV in Eugene, Oregon. Topic: The 19th of April, flight day 15, first landing opportunity. The crew of STS-131 awoke for flight day 15 and began their deorbit preparations. These preparations include closing the payload bay doors, activating the flash evaporator system and getting into their advanced crew escape suits ACES. The crew got as far as fluid loading where the crew consumes a set quantity of fluids to counteract the effects of gravity, in their deorbit preps. The crew was informed of the one-orbit wave off about one hour prior to the deorbit burn. After the crew was told of the wave off, they held in their procedures to see if they would be given a go for the second landing opportunity. However, they were not given a go for the second chance and the crew began backing out of their deorbit preps. 
Both landing chances were waved off due to bad weather at the Kennedy Space Center. Topic: The 20th of April, flight day 16 landing. Space Shuttle Discovery landed at 9:08 Eastern Daylight Saving Time, 13:08 Coordinated Universal Time, on runway 33 at Florida's Kennedy Space Center following a two-week mission in space. Topic: <laughs> Spacewalks. At least three spacewalks were planned for this mission. The main objectives for the three AVAs were as follows. Topic: <laughs> Wake up calls. NASA began a tradition of playing music to astronauts during the Gemini program, which was first used to wake up a flight crew during Apollo 15. Each track is specially chosen, often by their families, and usually has a special meaning to an individual member of the crew, or is applicable to their daily activities. Topic. See also 2010 in spaceflight List of human spaceflights List of International Space Station spacewalks List of Space Shuttle missions List of spacewalks 2000-2014